Jesus' most personal and powerful teachings are conversations with his disciples in the book of John. Nowhere else is his instruction both so simple and so deep. Take your place in the upper room to hear the heart of God that still speaks today. A lot of you have probably heard this old children's song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We talk about the love of God, we talk about the love of Jesus, but honestly, I think it's really hard for us to understand it. I don't think we have categories in which to really grasp what it means that Jesus loves me, that God really loves me. What we tend to do is our understanding of love is really based on the relationships that we've had in our lives. And so love for us is what we've learned through television, through movies, through songs, and through life experiences. But the love of Jesus for us is far deeper than any of that. The world has no categories for the love that God has for you and for me. You see, the love of God has no limits. It has no boundaries. The love of God is perfect in its kindness, perfect in its mercy. It's perfect in every way. It's perfect in its discipline. Unlike our human relationships, the love of God never says, I'll love you if, or I'll love you when, or I'll love you provided. God loves you without limits. And it's hard for us to grasp that. But this morning, we can grasp this. We have an invitation from Jesus to remain in his love. And he's going to teach us what it means and how we do that, how we remain in the love of Jesus that we can encounter, that we can experience this incredible love for ourselves. Friends, I know this. I don't want to just read about other people's relationship with God. I don't want to just hear about other people's relationship with God. I want to have my own encounter with the living God. I want to experience the love of God for myself. And the Bible promises that. But it's a choice that we get to make. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're doing a series that we're calling The Upper Room. And what we're doing is we're talking about the last teachings of Jesus before he would be arrested and crucified die on the cross, be buried, dead, and rise from the dead. And what Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he's teaching you and me, is how it is that we live this life apart from his physical presence among us. Because you see, in just a few hours, their relationship with Jesus that they had known for the last three years is going to be completely different. Which is why he promises that he's going to be with us through the Holy Spirit. But that's different from being able to touch Jesus and hold Jesus and, and, and sit with Jesus and eat with Jesus and see him with our own eyes. But it's no less powerful in terms of the love that we're going to experience. And so this morning, what I want to do is, in this passage that we're going to look at from John 15, we're going to talk about two challenges that Jesus brings to us. And there's two challenges that are connected to two of our seven values as a church. Earnestly seeking God and having relationship, real relationships, authentic relationships with one another. But beginning in verse 9 of John 15, we read these words. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. 
If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and I remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, to lay one's life down for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Incredible promises, incredible challenges, an amazing passage. Well, let's look at this this morning, and we want to look at the first command, earnestly seeking God by choosing to remain in Jesus. Again, I mentioned that one of our seven values is earnestly seeking God. That means that we are passionate and committed day by day by day to seek after God, to seek the heart of God, to know him, to encounter him in our lives. Friends, I don't have to wait to die to encounter the living God. I can encounter him the moment I choose to believe and then each day of the rest of my life as I choose to live in his joy, to live in his peace, to live in his love as he has called me to do and you to do in this passage. Listen to what it says. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Well, let's look look at this just very quickly. Number one, Jesus loves you. He loves you. Now, some of you look at your circumstances in life and you say, well, this isn't love. Look what I'm going through in my life. But we cannot, friends, we cannot judge the nature of God by our circumstances. We can only choose to understand our circumstances by what we know is eternally true about God. I know that God loves me even in those moments when he feels like he's at a distance. I know that God loves me even in those moments where my circumstances are challenging and they're difficult and they're hard. I know that God loves me because this is what the Bible has taught me. And here is the challenge for us. The challenge for us is to accept that and to choose to remain in his love. Now listen to what he says. He says, as my father has loved me, so have I loved you. As my father has loved me, as God the father has loved me, Jesus said, so I have loved you. And what we're going to see in a few moments, that as the father loved the son, as the son has loved us, so we are to love one another with that same love. That's where deep, meaningful relationships are born. That's where deep, meaningful human relationships are experienced. It comes out of the love of the Father that comes through the Son, that comes to us and flows through us to one another. As the Father has loved me, the standard by which Jesus loves you is the standard by which the Father has loved the Son. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. That's the nature of the love of Jesus for us. He says, he says this, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, I don't give you a lot of language and syntax, but in this particular case, it matters. Because what it means is, Jesus is loving me, and he will continue to love me. You know, he's talking to his disciples. If you believe and have committed your life to Jesus, you are his disciple. And as the Father has loved him, so Jesus is loving you. And that will continue for an eternity. And the other thing that we see here is that God chose you. You did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer in Jesus, what he did for you on the cross, if you believe that, It's because you were chosen by God. He gave you the ability to see his truth and to believe his truth. I got to tell you, this is extraordinary for me. 
When I, when I first became a Christian as a teenager, one of the things that struck me was that God chose me. Jesus chose me. That's amazing. Because you know what? There's nothing really beautiful in me, particularly back then, that was worth loving. Why did God love me? Because I was going to be a pastor one day? Nope. Because I was really good? Nope. Because I was really smart? Nope. You see, we live in a world where we're used to being chosen because we've earned it. I've been watching a little, not much, but a little bit of the NFL Combine. And basically that's where college graduating or college uh, people who are now eligible to be in the NFL, they go to this place called a Combine and they, they are put through all sorts of tests. How fast do they run the 40? And all these other tests, how much can they bench press? And they are chosen based on their physical agility and prowess. Quarterbacks, how smart are they? Can they throw a football straight? They will be chosen in about six to eight weeks. They'll be chosen based on their athletic ability. When people hire for business, on what basis are, their cho are they chosen? Well, sometimes it's, they're chosen by who they know. Sometimes it's their education level. Sometimes it is their, the way that they fit within the team. And so they're chosen. We live in a world where we are almost everything is involved being chosen by what we do, by who we are, by what we can accomplish. Husbands and wives, on what basis do we choose our spouse? On the basis of attraction and connection, most often. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're thinking dowry too, right? Okay, I won't. <laughs> but this idea that God chose me, how's it extraordinary? See, when you look at me, you think, boy, he must have been a great athlete. <laughs> okay, there are times to laugh and times to just show respect. <clears throat> so, I was often, okay, who gets stuck with Porter? Everybody's picked. Who, gets, who, who has to uh, take Porter? And for God to choose me, to choose me, just, it was extraordinary to me that he, he saw me and he knew me and he wanted me to be his child. He wanted to be part of his kingdom. Friends, that is amazing. So we read on and we say, how do we remain in this love that he tells us to remain in his love? How do we do that? Well, what Jesus says is by obeying his commands. We do it by obeying the commands of Jesus. Listen to what he says. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. How do I remain in the love of Jesus? By obeying his commands. Now, what is this connection here? The only thing I can think of is the connection of trust. And Two weeks ago, we talked a lot about this because in chapters 14 and 15, as Jesus is preparing his disciples, and we are his disciples, he keeps talking about obeying his commands. You see, I stay in the love of Jesus. I live in the love of Jesus by obeying his commands because obeying his commands is an act of trust. Oh, Jesus, I trust you. Now, every culture, every culture, there are things that are alien to the ways of God, to the commands of God. And in our culture today, we see it more and more and more. In my short lifetime, I have seen this, this culture change dramatically, going further and further and further from the ways of God and the commands that God has given to us. And so, friends, it's not natural for us to follow the commands of God unless we choose to do it. Otherwise, the tide, the, the tide and the current of our culture, is gonna, we're going to get caught up, and it's just going to pull us away further and further from the love of Jesus. Sometimes there are commands that, that God gives us in his word that, quite frankly, I just don't want to do. 
I don't want to do. It's just easier if I live the way I want to live, as if I know better how to live my life than God knows, and God's the one who made me. I choose to remain in the, in the love of Jesus by choosing, no matter what my culture says, no matter what my, my fallen nature wants to do, by choosing to obey his commands. What we tried, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, what we tried to do as our kids were growing up was to help them to understand that the commands of God are a gift to us. They are a gift to us. By following his commands, I choose to live in his joy. I choose to live in his peace. I choose to remain in him. I choose to live in his love. Why in the world would we turn our backs on the love of Jesus? Why would we not want to live and experience and encounter that incredible love that he has for us? I love this. As I was thinking about it, I began to just look at my own life. And I had to ask myself these questions. Where am I not obeying and loving the Lord today? Where am I not living in the love of Jesus? Where am I disobeying his commands? Is there a choice that I'm making in a relationship that I shouldn't be making? Is there a moral choice that I'm making that's not honoring to God? Is it, how am I spending my time? Am I spending my time in a way that honors God? How am I spending my money? Am I spending my money in a way that honors God, letting him know that all that I have belongs to him? How am I living my life? I belong to him. How am I living my life? What am I feeding my mind and my heart and my soul when I watch television or I listen to a podcast or I listen to music or I read a book? What am I feeding my heart and my mind and my soul? Is that honoring to Jesus? Friends, I want to live in the love of Jesus. Don't you? I want to remain in the love of Jesus. And we do that by choosing to obey his commands. Here's a second thing that I want you to see. He tells us that our purpose in this life is to glorify God by bearing fruit, producing fruit that will last forever. I love this. I wrote this down because I've done, I think, we have seasons like this, but I think I've done five, tomorrow I'll do another a funeral service. I think I've done five in the last six weeks. And one of the things that happens when I do this is I'm reminded about what really matters. I get so caught up in all these things the world says I need when I see these people come to the end of their life and I realize what matters isn't what I take out of this world because I'm not taking anything with me. What matters isn't what I leave to the next generation. What matters is how I have loved others by the love of Jesus and how I've allowed God to impact the world through me. So I wrote this down. The greatest use of your life is to invest it in that which will outlast your life. Let me say that again. The greatest use of your life will be to invest in things that will literally outlast your life. Well, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that we are sharing Jesus with others. We are loving others with the love of Jesus. We are making a difference forever by the grace of God. My dad did that for my family. My dad, who was raised in a very dysfunctional situation, he came to Jesus as a very young person. He found himself, he'd never heard the name of Jesus that he remembers, but he remembers as he was forced to live in the garage to go on his knees every night and as a little fourth grader, third grader, and pray to Jesus. And then he decided he was going to change the direction of the generations. And he did. He didn't grow up in a Christian environment. But all four of his boys loved Jesus. All of his grandchildren who were of age loved Jesus All of his great-grandchildren who are of age love Jesus. He changed the trajectory because he invested in his children. And he invested in things that mattered. When I think of heaven, and this is an image I often have, 
And I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but I imagine somebody coming up to me and thanking me. And I'm looking at them and saying, well, I don't even recognize you. What are you thanking me for? And then saying, well, you supported a missionary through your church who ended up teaching my, my great-great-great-grandparents about Jesus and teaching them how to believe in Jesus and how to follow Jesus. And because of that, you cha that changed the generations and so that I grew up in a Christian home. And, I'll, and I can imagine myself thinking, I did that? Or running in the L.A. Marathon or, or, or supporting somebody who's running in the L.A. Marathon and raising uh, money for clean drinking water for people in Africa. And, and one day somebody coming up and because of that clean water and, and, the, and the attention that goes to God, not to us, but to God and the local church. And having them say thank you. You see, friends, that is investing. That is inve using your life to invest in that which will outlast your life. I want the greatest thing that I leave behind are children and grandchildren who love the Lord. I want to make an impact on every person that God has brought along my path for Jesus. I love what I do because I get to tell people about Jesus. And it's such a gift, but you can do that as well. And then we see the blessings that come. And I'm going to go through this. Fat. Well, let me read this. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Appointed you. See, Jesus chose me and he appointed me. You too. He appointed you too. Not just me. He appointed all of us who are followers of Jesus that you would go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. You may go bear fruit. Now, last week, Pastor Lon rightly taught us in the first part of chapter 15 that he talked about the fruit as being the fruit of the presence of the Spirit in our lives. Absolutely. Here is a shift, and he's talking now about fruit that is produced through the way we live our life, for the impact that we make for the kingdom of God. That is fruit that will last. We go in obedience to Jesus in our neighborhood, in our school, in our workplace, and we talk about Jesus, we share him with others, and we live a life that honors him in obedience to him, and we are producing fruit that will last long after our lives are over. And so what are the blessings that come with living in the love of Jesus. I'm going to go through these quickly, but listen to these. You will have the joy of Jesus. Man, if you were with us two weeks ago, we talked about, Jesus said, I give you my peace. My peace I give you. My peace I leave you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And we talked about that peace. Now, here just a, uh, just a chapter later, he says, when you remain in my love, I am going to give you my joy. Listen to this. I have told you this so that my joy, the joy of Jesus, might be in you and that your joy would be lacking, right? Is that what it says? No. It says that it would be absolutely complete, lacking nothing. Does that describe your joy today? Does that, does that describe your joy on Monday morning when you get up and you got to go to work or go to school? Does that describe your joy when life isn't going the way you want it to? You see, joy is not about my circumstances. Just like peace, it's not about my circumstances. I don't even have to produce it. As I live in the obedience of to Jesus, I'm living in the love of Jesus, and one of the byproducts of that is that I receive his love. I don't have to produce it. I receive it as a gift. By remaining in Jesus, I, I love this quote from, um, from John Piper. Listen to what it says. He describes joy this way. Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul, produced by the Holy Spirit, not by me, not by me, produced by the Holy Spirit 
as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world and even in our circumstances. And I know some of you are going through hard things right now. Here's the second thing we see, that we will know the friendship of Jesus. If we remain in Jesus by obeying his commands, we will know his friendship. Listen to this. You are my friends, Jesus said, if what? If I do what he commands. I no longer call you servants. You're no longer servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. What's the master's business? What is the business of Jesus? It's to transform lives. It's to transform the world. We know the Father's business. We are about the business of Jesus. Listen to what he says. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You know, friends, Jesus is my friend. He's my friend. I seek to live in obedience to him, and he's my friend. And he has shared with me what he wants to do in this world today through me. And he will do that for you as well. And then we read on and we see another great blessing of remaining in the love of Jesus is I get to partner in the ministry of Jesus. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit. Go into your neighborhood, go into your family, go into your school, go into your work, go into the ball field, go on vacation and bear fruit. And he, goes the, and he says, fruit that will last, so whatever you ask in my name, I will give you. Now, some of you might be thinking, you know, I bought a lotto ticket last night. In the name of Jesus, <laughs> I pray that I win, that those are the numbers that come up. I'm so bummed I've never won. I've never bought a ticket, but I'm so bummed I've never won. That's not what he's talking about here. He's saying, if you know your father's business, if you know the master's business, and you're committed to that by remaining in the love of Jesus, carrying on the work of Jesus, then you will want the things that Jesus wants to do in this world. And so you ask Jesus as he gives you the desires for the things that he desires. Then you see incredible things happen. Friends, I have seen amazing miracles in my life. Because God's people have prayed as they've partnered with Jesus in ministry. It's extraordinary. And then we come to this last item this morning. And this is the second, this is the second, another, um, another value of our church. The first one we looked at this morning is seeking after God, earnestly seeking after God. This one is Engaging relationships. Now, listen to this, folks. Listen to this. We engage in relationships with others as believers, as Christians, by loving them with the love of Jesus. As the Father loved me, Jesus said, so I have loved you. Now, love one another in the way that I have loved you. We um, often quote Jesus when he was asked to sum up the laws. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But in John 13, Jesus said, I give you a new command. No longer do I love others as I have loved myself, which isn't always that pretty. But now the standard is, as Christians, we love one another in the same way that Jesus loved us. I love you, not as I love myself, but as Jesus loves me. Do you see it? Do you see it? I can't do that apart from the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he says. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. That is the standard by which we are to love one another. And he goes on to say this, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
Friends, I, when I think about this, chances are, in our American culture, I probably won't have the opportunity to lay down my life for you. Or you won't have the opportunity to lay down your life for me. Now, Jesus laid down his life for us. He, greater love is no one than this, to lay one's life down for one's friends. Jesus did that for you, and he did it for me. But I want you to think about this. What does it mean for you to sacrifice for the people in your lives? What we try to teach our children is this. Love is giving up what you want for yourself to give to someone else what God wants for them. What would it mean for you to do that in your marriage? What would it mean to do that for your, bro- your siblings? Ooh, You see, it's easier to love them than it is often to love the people that are closest to us. What would it mean for you to lay down your life for a friend? Think of somebody, a friend that you have. What would it mean for you to sacrifice for your friend? What would it mean for you to sacrifice for a spouse or a parent? What would it mean for you to sacrifice for a brother or a sister? What would it mean for you to sacrifice for a neighbor? What would it mean for you to sacrifice for someone you work, you work with or maybe even work for? What would that look like? I remember my friend Kevin Harney, many of you know, early in his marriage, it was important to his wife Sherry that their bed be made every morning. I don't understand that. And so every morning, since the, his first year of marriage, he made a commitment to Sherry, I will make the bed every morning, and he has for over 40 years. It's that kind of thing. Now, does he want to make the bed? No. But he does it as an act of service to say, I am loving you with the love of Jesus. Practical and powerful. I'm going to close with this story that I came across that I think is just a beautiful picture of the love of Jesus. It's about a young couple named Ryan and Morgan who had adopted a child that lived overseas. The adoption process was finished, but before they could go and collect their child, before their child was sent to the United States, the country closed up, and they stopped all adoptions. They had already finalized the adoption, but they were not allowed to take their child. So here's, I want you to hear this. They'd passed through all the legal processes in the country. Charlie was their son. But right before the day when they were supposed to pick Charlie up from the orphanage, things changed. There were some political upheavals, and the country froze the process. No more children were going to be able to leave the country. Charlie could not come to Ryan and Morgan, so they decided to go to him. They flew over from the United States, and basically they camped outside the orphanage, half their time loving their son Charlie, half the time battling the political system that was keeping them from being able to take their son home. After a few weeks, Morgan had to go back home. But Ryan, Ryan stayed. It was Christmas time. This is not where he wanted to be, away from home, far from his family. But here was a father, a father who loved his son. Since his son could not come to him, he was going to go to his son, and he was going to fight for his son. There would be more days and weeks of struggle, but Ryan eventually was able to bring Charlie home. That Christmas, as Ryan battled a corrupt court system, that was on the other side of the world, he himself was a picture of the kind of eternal father that Jesus is for anyone who asks him to be. Jesus went far further for us than Ryan went for his son. He didn't leave a country of privilege to move to a country of poverty. No, he left the riches of heaven to come to a world of pain. He did all that because he loves you. He did all that because he wants to be with you. 
He came to you to ensure that you could go to be with him. And it cost him far more than a plane ticket. Jesus loves you. And all he asks is that you remain in his love. Will you pray with me? Father, we ask in in this morning that you would minister powerfully and to our hearts and our minds, that you would speak to us, that you would help us to understand what it means that Jesus loves us, that Jesus loves me, that Jesus loves you. Lord, I pray for any who long to live in the love that you have for them, that, they, that you would reveal any areas of their lives, Lord, that they are living in disobedience to your commands, that they may make a shift, a change, and experience the joy of living in the love of Jesus. And Jesus, I pray that you would empower us to love one another, not according to the way we love ourselves, not according to the standards of our culture and world, but according to the way that you have loved us. In the name of Jesus and for his sake and the sake of his kingdom, we pray. Amen.